All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Matias Brizzoni. First of all, I want to thank um, the whole committee for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. I know we, we've been trying to do it for a long time, so I'm, I'm glad uh, it eventually happened. Um, I'm uh, one of the pediatric surgeons here at Stanford. I've been here since 2009. Uh, and of course, you know, got very lucky to, to know the NICU uh, folks as a fellow and then uh, as junior faculty. And then a few years went by and I'm still here. So, so that's, that's um, I still have to pinch myself to believe I'm in such a wonderful place. So thank you so much. And uh, we're just going to get started. And uh, we were just chatting about the questions. If there's any moment that you want to interrupt, please go ahead. Uh, I know Christina is going to be um, moderating the session, so feel free to interrupt, to, uh, interrupt me at any time. So I'm going to start sharing my screen here. The, um, the idea today is to give an update on what is it that we do when we take these little babies to the operating room and bring them back. I feel um, that in a way, as surgeons, we cheat a little bit because we know what's going on inside. We, we sort of see it inside and, and, and try to do whatever we can to fix it and then uh, come back to the NICU and explain what we've done. But I think, because I remember sort of, you know, dreaming about doing these operations and it was very hard to understand them until I finally saw one. And, and of course, when you start assisting and doing them, that's when you really understand the disease process. Uh, so I was hoping to give you an update on what is it that we see from the operating room more than anything in what we call minimal access surgery in neonates. I have a, a strong interest in this, not only neonates, but also low weight neonates. Um, and, and I was hoping to show you a little bit of this um, and, and give you a little bit more of the reality of what we see in the operating room so you understand when we bring the babies back to the NICU. Uh, what is it that we've done? And same thing with uh, referral. Uh, you know, for referring physicians, always a little bit difficult to understand what is it that we're doing. So hopefully this will clarify a little bit or just part of that. Um, we call it minimal access surgery and many people call it minimally invasive. Actually, it's not minimally invasive. They're very big operations. So it's a maximal operation, but we try to minimize the collateral damage. And um, so ideally we would take these babies to the operating room and bring them back as close as possible to what they were before. Um, so we wanna minimize this collateral damage that these big, big operations do. And hopefully it could be in any age or any size. As you can imagine, as, as things evolved, we were operating on smaller uh, children but it used to be a contraindication. You know, you couldn't do it in little ones. And thanks to technology and, and all the advances in the field, now we're able to do it in smaller babies. So why is it that we try so hard to make little incisions? Why is it that we try so hard to keep everything as stealth as possible? So as you can imagine, there's decreased pain and morbidity. Very hard to gauge pain in the neonates but uh, just from adult and toddler uh, experience, these things hurt, big incisions hurt, and we wanna do our best to decrease the pain postoperatively. Not only that, but big incisions will cause bigger stress and uh, will result in a slower recovery. So by giving small incisions, we feel we're gonna cause less stress on the body and get these babies to recover faster. Of course, no one's, um, you know, at, th at their age, that's very hard to gauge also, but ideally if we can get them out of the hospital earlier, that would be great. When we operate in the intestine and the abdominal cavity, uh, big incisions will result in more sort of injury to the bowel, if you may. So the bowel gets shut down after these big operations. And by minimizing the incisions, we, we hope that the ileus that they get postoperatively might not be uh, such a, 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 as an issue. Um, not only that, as the bowel recovers, they can return back to feeds at an earlier time. Um, of course, when we talk about returning to normal activity, this is more from the parents than for the neonates, but it, it does affect the sort of the social environment of these families. So we wanna do our best to get them back to normal as soon as possible. The other thing that uh, we see, these cameras give you a lot of magnification and close-up. So the improved visualization 
in little children is important. So when you come to the operating room and you see an open operation, it's just the surgeon who can see what's going on. But if you are able to put this on a monitor with magnification, everybody in the room can see this. Anesthesia, students, residents, assistants, the scrub nurse. And it's very important to keep everybody on board of what's going on. We appreciate the feedback in the room if there's anything that people pick up on. So I, I do think that overall it, it um, results in a great advantage towards patient care because now everybody can see what's going on. There should be fewer long-term complications because uh, as you can imagine, these big incisions either in the abdomen or in the chest will bring deformities in the future, will bring hernias in the future, will bring bad scars in the future. And, uh, and this has a deep impact uh, on patients. I, again, it's hard to gauge the, cosmetical, the, you know, the cosmetics in neonates, how things are gonna turn out many years later, but I can tell you that a small scar in a neonate results in a very big scar when you grow into an adult. It doesn't disappear, it doesn't go away. In fact, it gets bigger as you grow with it. The main disadvantage is that we really need to stay open uh, and uh, sort of push the envelope as much as we can because uh, if we believe that this is be better for patient care, we have to readjust our mind the whole time and we have to retrain ourselves. We have to educate ourselves and keep working towards making things better. It is technically demanding. Sometimes the cases are gonna take longer than if you do them open. But again, if you look at all the advantages I was showing you, it does make uh, sort of a big impact in this patients and families. We do require special instruments and unfortunately we don't have many times and we have to adapt whatever we have from the adult world into children's and I'll show you a little bit more of that as we move along. And, um, and there is a learning curve, you know, not everybody can just start doing it. Um, you'd really need to train yourself and uh, bring those increased operative times to normal in order to be, to do a safe operation. So this is an idea of sizes. So this is a neonate and to your right, you can see the size of, an, of the telescope and the size of a grasper. So imagine trying to put that in the baby's chest or in the baby's abdomen, it just doesn't fit. So we, we are challenged by these things. Um, and specifically in, ne in neonates, when we operate either in the chest or in the abdomen, we insufflate with CO2. So are they gonna tolerate this? We either create a pneumothorax or we create a pneumoperitoneum and some of these babies may not tolerate it. So, so that's something that we have to work with the baby's physiology. We do have very small working spaces. So when you operate in the chest and repair, for example, an esophageal atresia, you're almost operating inside an egg to give you an idea on how big the space it is that you have when you start doing these techniques. Techniques. The tissues are very fragile. The tensile strength is very poor. So just you know, pulling on sutures or pulling on tissue can create tear. So you have to be very careful at that level. Uh, their blood volume is extremely low, so uh, any artery that could bleed significantly may get you in trouble much faster than in older patients. And uh, we do have the challenges of prematurity, poor lung function, poor cardiac function. Uh, they don't control temperature very well, so we have to be very mindful of all these things as we uh, operate on them. And then there's a big question about children versus scars. Um, you know, some people think it's a scar, don't worry about it. I, I see it more of that this will cause a deformity in the future. Um, of course, the baby will never know any different, uh, but the parents will. And as they grow older, these children will become more um, sort of aware that they're different and may affect them as they grow older. Um, and I'm telling you, parents do care about scars. This is a PowerPoint that a father sent me after doing an inguinal hernia, where the only incision is the one you see uh, to the top left of the screen, where it says tube-like cyst removed during surgery. So the only incision is like a little needle hole up there, but he was still very worried about the scars and showed me all these pictures and, and look how terrible it looks. And actually, to me, it looked really good. Um, so this is just a hernia repair, and you can see how uh, you know, scars will affect the whole family, uh, not to everyone, but, but it, it, it does affect most people. And 
as you see in this picture, basically the right tools are not available to us for uh, to, uh, operating in neonates. If you compare the volume of surgeries we do in neonates compared to adults, the difference is massive. And unfortunately, the industries look for volume, they look for money, they look for profit. In neonates, uh, that is very hard to achieve because we don't have massive volume of disease. By definition, children will get sick much less than adults. So that's something we're fighting with the industry uh, constantly. So that way we can get the right tools available to us. I'm gonna give you an example of a, a typical congenital anomaly we deal with. Uh, so I can put you a little bit in perspective on what is it that we do in the operating room. This is uh, a case of an esophageal atresia. As you can see in this picture, there's different types of esophageal atresia, but the most common one we see is the one uh, to the bottom, the type three, in which we have uh, discontinuity in the esophagus. So that's the esophageal atresia part of it. So the atresia is proximal as you can see in the picture, and the tracheoesophageal fistula is distal. So the distal part of the esophagus is connected to the trachea, more or less at the level of the carina. So now that you see this picture, I'm gonna to try to show you a video of um, thoracoscopic repair. Thoracoscopic basically means we go into the chest, insufflate with CO2, compress the lung that way, and then get exposure, try to find the atresia, try to find the fistula, divide the fistula, so disconnect, the airway from the GI tract and then put the two ends together via suturing. So here's the video. As, um, I'm showing you, my cursor will point a little bit. This is the azygous vein draining into the vena cava that you could see up here. This little white structure here is the phrenic nerve. The lung is all collapsed, which is the pink area down here. And first thing we do is we're gonna divide this azygous vein uh, in order to get exposure to our tracheoesophageal fistula. These instruments, to give you an idea, are three millimeters in size. So we're operating in a very small chest in a baby that's less than three kilos. Uh, and that's what I'm saying that you're almost like operating inside an egg. So as we keep dissecting, you're gonna find that we have the vagus nerve down here, the trachea right under it, and then there's a tube pushing from the mouth that what you saw there was the esophag esophagus on the top. So it's the upper esophageal pouch. But now what we're dissecting is the connection between the esophagus and the trachea. I don't know if you can tell, but that's the trachea now. They see how the air is insufflating the trachea. The fistula is divided in between sutures. And now we're gonna find the upper pouch. And with needles and sutures, we're gonna bring it together to the lower pouch. So now we're doing interrupted suturing under a lot of magnification. You can see sort of the proximal and the distal end of the esophagus. And little by little, we're putting it together, tying it. And then there's a nasogastric tube going through and through the upper and lower pouch in order to uh, technically show us where the anterior wall of the anastomosis is. And now we're completing the suturing with intracorporeal knot tying and you can see how the upper and lower esophagus are now connected right there. And as we lift it up, you can see where the tracheoesophageal fistula was. So just by looking at these images, you can get a little bit of an idea on how little the spaces are. And this is what we basically do once we take the patients to the operating room with tracheoesophageal fistula. So when we come back to the NICU and all the sort of um, asks we have, is just like the baby doesn't get reintubated right away because if you happen to extubate this baby and intubate quickly and that tube happens to go into the esophagus, this whole uh, anastomosis, which is very delicate, just falls apart. So that's one of the reasons why we say, please, if someone's gonna reintubate this baby, let's make sure it's the most experienced person in the NICU. This is not a good case to be practicing on how to intubate. And that's the reason why we, we say these things. So there are, there are different cases. I'm gonna show you another one uh, and basically with the struggles we have, this is a, a thoracoscopic lobectomy. We're removing a lobe because of uh, congenital lung malformation, but look at the size of the vessel sealer compared to the type of vessel we're dividing. This is a branch of the pulmonary artery, and you can see how easily this can get torn. And, um, and that instrument is just very hard for us to deal with. And now we're dealing just with the bronchus and we're trying to staple the bronchus with a mechanical stapler. And you can see the struggle of trying to get this into the space where you have to operate and how things 
can potentially go wrong. This is sort of an older case. Now we have much smaller instruments, thankfully. Um, but just to give you an idea, when you're doing these things, you're thinking, okay, what am I doing? You know, because you're really sort of exposing yourself to a lot of trouble. And, but on the other hand, by doing these things, you start to get better at, at them and really make a case for what kind of instruments you need. And this is what we order. And now we have much smaller vessel sealers. It looks like we are having some technical difficulties. Christina? Hi, thank you, Megan. Good afternoon, everybody. Christina Oldini. We're going to hold on a second. My feeling is probably Dr. Brissoni had to sign off and come back on. So I have to tell you, it's 1.30. We started the event at 8 this morning, and this is our first major glitch. So um, in this world we live in today, I would actually say, um, it's not too bad, Megan. So I think what we'll do is hold on. Um, it's been incredibly interesting so far. So um, if you can kind of gather your thoughts as far as questions, um, I'd love to know a little bit more, just to throw something out a little bit more about his experience. I mean, how do you gain, what kind of fellowship is involved with something like this to be able to, I, I mean, I worked with a minimally, uh, we did call an invasive surgeon up at CPMC in San Francisco. We had a, a big MIG program, and you know, these involve intense fellowships. Um, so I'd love to, you know, when you're working on this size infant, really what kind of experience do you need? So I think I might be asking him that later on. But uh, oh, and it looks like he's joining it. No problem. Okay. Yes. Yeah, everything's good. Sorry, can you, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Can you hear no me? No worries. Now? Yeah, you're live and everything's good. So you guys just want to start screen sharing again. And I was just telling everybody, this is not bad. Can you hear me, Christina? I can. Can you not hear me, Matias? Megan? Yep, I can hear you. We can hear you, Matias, but it looks like you might be frozen again on your video. Megan, do you have his phone number? Are you able to go ahead and text him or have Melissa text him? Yes, we are on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, anyway, so I think, uh, you know, asking about if there's time, asking about experience. Um, for those of you that uh, potentially, you know, we did invite students to this event for free, or excuse me, for $25. And I'm wondering if, there are any students out there who are interested in that, but what a fellowship would look like, how many years of experience do you need to be able to be competent at this type of surgery? So um, hang in there with us. We're hoping he's gonna be able to, to come back on shortly. I hope you enjoyed Dr. Gibbs last presentation. Um, the toolkit has gone, I, I wish I had the number, I think he went over it, but how many toolkits have been downloaded from the CMQCC website um, for sepsis? It's been quite a few. Since I have the time, what I would like to tell everybody is that CMQCC and the California Department of Public Health Maternal Child and Adolescent Health Division are in the process of reviewing and updating two toolkits. So the first toolkit that uh, will be released will be um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. We're very excited about that. And then the one that we are currently working on in editing, which will go to the state for review is the hemorrhage toolkit. So both of those actually have quite a few updates. So um, we're hoping to have those out um, one before the end of the year, then hopefully the beginning of 2022, we'll be able to re release the hemorrhage toolkit. So, um, you know, that, that's going well. <laughs> All right, so hopefully Dr. Personi will sign on here. We're gonna wait another minute here and uh, 
hopefully we'll see him. There's a question that's just come in. I wonder if it's more of a chat. Oh, great. So the question came in is what type of follow-up is in place for post-surgical neonatal patients when they are discharged from the NICU? So that's, that's excellent. And you know what, Courtney? Um, and I know, just so you know, Courtney Brielt is, a, I'm a fan. She is the Director of Quality for the California Perinatal Quality Care Cooperative at Stanford. And uh, that is our, our partner group here at Stanford. And what I'm wondering, Courtney, um, that I'd be interested in knowing on this front too, if there's time, is, um, is there a high-risk follow-up specific to, to these types of patients? Um, so when, um, when patients have to undergo, you know, major surgery, just like you said, um, is there, is there HR, HR at high risk infant follow-up ramifications for an, an infant like that? So we'll, we'll see what it says. So I've got a couple questions, um, Couple questions line up. Everyone's working on it, <laughs> and you should be just uh, signing on again in another second. Oh, and that's wonderful. Courtney's going to uh, do a little uh, back end, uh, back end uh, investigative work on that. So we'll see what happens. But um, I know you know that follow up obviously is different for for adult patients. But you, you, when you work with these tiny infants, things certainly do change. So. That's an understatement. I want to talk a little bit about the end of the day. Dr. Tricia Wright will be joining us after Dr. Brussoni. Dr. Wright is a member of the UCSF faculty in OBGYN. She's also boarded in um, addiction medicine. And I have to tell you, I was the clinical lead on the Mother Baby Substance Exposure Initiative Toolkit this past year. And Dr. Wright's talk, which will start um, a little bit after two o'clock, I think, um, is really stellar. Her, her slide deck is really all encompassing. Okay, I'm and, back. Uh, Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, hold on, Matias. I'm just closing out. So, anyway, we look forward to Dr. Wright meeting with us later. Matias, we're already lighting up some questions for you. So, we're going to let you take it away, and then we have a few for you after. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. All good. The again. So, what, what, was the last, what was the last slide you, uh, you heard? You were going, you were still in surgery, I believe. You were still up. Yeah, you were still. Oh, no, no. It was the, the child on the skateboard. Oh, okay, great. We all knew that was yeah. a bad decision, that we knew that would be a bad decision on his part. <laughs> take, take it away. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. No, I was just saying that we do have some considerations and sort of thoughts and tricks in order to deal with all these difficulties that, that, that we see in the operating room. And one of them is try to make sure we are in very strong communication with our anesthesiologists. He, what we call the blood brain barrier. He, I'll let you decide who you think it's blood and whose brain. Um, but basically we need to be in constant communication with them uh, about the physiology of the patient, what's going on, are they tolerating what we're doing? And that's the other advantage that the anesthesiologist can see exactly what's happening on the screen, any blood loss, any intraoperative complication, we can adjust very quickly. Um, this is a, a, a very sort of um, dif difficult area to deal with in the abdomen and babies that are so small because we have the two arteries and the vein in the umbilical cord. And we have to make sure we insert our needle to create the, the pneumoperitoneum in a very safe place in order to avoid um, gas embolism. So if you happen to put this needle into the umbilical vein, you could get a fatal complication. So uh, there are different techniques on how to do this, but this is something that the surgeons need to be aware. Of. And that's how we get obsessed with the belly button. That's why I tell our residents and fellows, once you become obsessed with the belly button, then you know you want to become a pediatric surgeon because that's, that's what we try to deal with you know, when we're operating. Then there's another trick we developed called, I call the string puppet show, which basically in these abdomens that are so small, putting additional graspers is very, very hard. Everything gets very crowded. So I'm gonna show you a video of a duodenal atresia patient. And as you can see, we're putting needles right through the abdomen. This is the stomach and the duodenal atresia right left of, of, of the, the needle right here. And we're using these strings 
to mobilize the stomach out of the way, for example, and that's why I call it the puppet show. We can start to move it up and down as we please there. And you can see there's gonna be other sutures. There's gonna be one at the dome of the gallbladder right here, so we can retract it out of the way, and one in the falciform ligament to lift up the liver. And all of a sudden, our exposure is much better, and we can work just with the two instruments, mobilizing everything and try to repair the duodenal atresia that way. So sometimes when these babies go back to the NICU, you're gonna see a lot of needle holes, but these needle holes are basically just uh, strings that help, help us retract that become completely unnoticeable as the babies grow. We did look at our experience here with uh, babies that are less than three kilos in all of these sort of complex operations. And uh, we studied, um, you know, between 2009 and 2016, all the babies that we've done, that we did uh, under three kilos at the time of the operation. And we collected 46 minimal access cases and then 17 open cases just to have a control group. The conversion rate was very low. It was about 6.7%. And the complication rate, fortunately, was also very low with no mortality associated with the procedure. These are the type of cases we've done. Nissen fundoplications for reflux, duodenal atresias, LAD procedure for malrotation, esophageal atresia repair, congenital diaphragmatic hernia repair. So as you can, as you can see, these are all very big operations that we try to do uh, with little incisions and these techniques in order to minimize the collateral damage. And as you can see here, the um, weight at, at um, average weight at operation was 2.5 for, for the minimal access cases and 2.2 for the open cases, which makes sense, you know, when they're too little these things become very challenging. Um, and, um, and as you can see, you know, there were very good outcomes and these babies in the long run have done very well as far as we can tell from our clinic follow-up. I'm gonna show you a more common operation now that we do with just needle holes. And this is an inguinal hernia. So we get referrals all the time to operate on these babies. And what we tend to do is we try to let them grow a little bit, but not necessarily size-wise, but we want to see what the social and uh, medical condition of the baby is because we want to fix these hernias right before they're ready to go home. That way they don't have to leave the NICU and then come back for an operation and stay overnight for observation. So we try to time it right before discharge. So this is a, um, a girl with a right inguinal hernia. And um, is created a let me bring millimeters. this volume down. And you can see that's a little stab incision that we make at the level of the deep inguinal ring. And we're gonna create a little pocket just with very fine instruments. And this is where the suture will get hidden after we do the repair. So there's pneumoperitoneum through that cannula in the belly button. Again, back to the obsession with the belly button because it's a congenital scar. So you won't see anything as they grow older. And this is the defect for the internal hernia. So this is the epigastric artery. This is the defect where the bowel sneaks through. This is the round ligament in this little girl. And you see the needle going through and through the middle of the defect. Now the needle is going to come out through the skin. And we're going to back the needle out through the insertion site where we're just creating our little pocket. Um, so as you advance the needle back, instead of having an incision, all you have is just this needle uh, hole. So now the needle goes back out and we're gonna advance it for a second pass and encircle the entire hernia this time. And that will make a more durable repair. So now the needle goes back in, we're gonna look at it with the camera inside the abdomen with a lot of detail. And now the needle is, uh, down here you have the femoral vein and iliac artery. So you can see the magnification we have to stay away from those vessels, away from the epigastric artery that we're sort of shaving here as, as we keep advancing this needle. And this needle will now come across the skin again, and we're gonna back the needle out through the original insertion site. And you can see how the suture ligature of this hernia sac will be sort of airtight and watertight and try to prevent anything from going right through it. So you can see the two passes there. And as we tie the suture, the peritoneum will all purse string together. And um, I'll show you now on the inside what it looks like. And now the hernia is gone.
And these are all very durable repairs. And you can see how there's no scars in the growing and in the belly button, that little incision will, like I said, it's just we're using the congenital scar we all have right in the middle of the belly button. So it, it does become more of a stealth operation. This doesn't go for, you know, just the laparoscopy or thoracoscopy. We try to apply these techniques for other things. For example, gastroschisis that, as you can imagine, can bring such a big deformity in the abdomen. So, so these are pictures of traditional suture closures of gastroschisis. You can see uh, these kids will look different than their peers. So what do we do, for example? So this is a gastroschisis you can see to the left. And if we can get lucky and get a primary reduction, we use the umbilical cord, as you can see here, as a dressing instead of using sutures. And as they grow older, they grow with almost a normal looking belly button. And if for some reason you cannot reduce the gastroschisis right away, we put it in a silo. So this is a spring-loaded silastic bag that um, will let us reduce it in a stage fashion because these babies have no abdominal domain. And if you happen to push everything and the baby's not tolerating it, this could be a very sort of hard on their lungs and heart. So we have to do it more gradually. And same thing, once we get to reduce everything, we put a special dressing and avoid sutures, sutures in order to let the belly button contract and eventually they have a much better cosmetic outcome. So things we've learned uh, about all these studies and our experience with these patients is that most infants will tolerate the CO2 insufflation either in the chest or in the abdomen and will not have cardiac or respiratory compromise. However, it has to be very gentle. It can just happen, um, you know, at the same rate that we, we do it in older children or adults. It won't result in fluid electro, electrolyte abnormalities and at low flow rates, they can really tolerate this very well without losing their temperature control. And not only that, we've done it in babies that already have lung disease, already have cardiac disease, and, and they tolerate it in a remarkable way. So I'll just finish with this thought. Um, we, we do have to push the envelope and be open and, and uh, be ready for change and try to do whatever we can to treat our, our patients in the best way possible. Um, this is um, a record company that said, we don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on the way out. And this was Decca Records rejecting the Beatles uh, back, back then. So just remember predictions are also very difficult, especially about the future. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. I know I can't cover the whole pediatric surgery in, 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 in about 40 minutes, but at least you get an idea of what we deal with and what, when you refer a patient for things like this, how we deal with it. And when we com communicate with the NICU, that, those are the reasons why we say what we say. So thank you very much. Boy, was that a bad call on the Beatles, huh? <laughs> Boy, okay. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Brizzoni. You have some followers out there that are amazed at, uh, amazed at this. So um, I think I'm going to start with one and yeah. then we'll, we'll venture off in a little bit more into the follow-up. So what I want to start you with, and I mentioned this when you were off, offline there, was tell us about you. I mean, this is such a, a skill set. I, I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing, actually, the skill set you need for this. Tell us about a fellowship. Tell us about what what schooling, education, and experience entail in order to get to your level? Yeah, so I'm, I'm originally from Argentina, and I did medical school in Argentina and did adult general surgery in Argentina. And at that time, I thought I want to become a transplant surgeon. That's what brought me to the United States. I went to Omaha, Nebraska, where they had a, a, a very big transplant program, and I started to do a lot of pediatric transplant. And pediatric transplantation got me into the world of children, basically, because interaction with the families and, uh, you know, just pediatric surgeons in general, you know, transplant is sort of very repetitive in a way, and I didn't like that. I, I was more interested in, in the diseases in children when they were even younger. And that's when I said, wow, I think this is my calling. This is what I want to do. So in order to become a pediatric surgeon in the U.S., you have to be an adult surgeon in the U.S., in order to become an adult surgeon in the US, you have to do your residency here. You won't get, you know, if you do your residency abroad, that gives you a little bit of credit, but, but you cannot be board certified. So I did my residency in adult surgery. And then I was the first fellow at Stanford here in 2009 when they opened the program. So like I said, you know, very lucky 
um, that they took me and, uh, and it's been such a fun journey since then. So then you do two years of pediatric surgery, um, which is only operating in children. So you use all your skills, you know, from adult surgery, but you try to fine tune them towards surgery and uh, towards pediatric surgery. And after that, I became the program director for the fellowship. And I've been, you know, trying to, to of course, assist and to my partners in developing all these new surgeons and try to focus on these technique, techniques in order to help our patients uh, better. So that's more or less the journey, you know, that was a few minutes. It took a few years though, but, um, but like I said, it was a fun journey though. It sounds like you, uh, you feel that way. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, follow-up. So what kind of follow-up are you looking for post-surgical neonatal patients when they're discharged? Yeah. So Ideally, we see them about two weeks after the operation and then three months after the operation. And then I'd like to see them when they're about eight, nine, 10, 11 months when they're incorporating a lot of solid food now, because everything we do with breast milk is easy. But once they start incorporating solid foods, any anastomosis we've done in the chest or in the abdomen can get blocked. They can get narrowings and that may need further management because this is all that esophageal I was showing you is like connecting a noodle to a noodle, right? So that has to grow with the baby. And many of these babies will need some fine tuning as they grow older, like dilations. I've seen teenagers that had esophageal atresia repair when they're littles and now they're wolfing down a hot dog or a hamburger with his friends or her friends. <laughs> and, um, and it just doesn't go as well. So, so we have to do some fine tuning. So long-term follow-up for these patients is very important. We do long-term follow-up with chest x-rays and physical exams to make sure there are no chest wall deformities. When you do bigger incisions, these babies can get pectus excavatum. They can get the scapulas completely uneven. They can get scoliosis, uh, all sorts of chest wall deformities that we have to be monitoring for. Um, and yes, unfortunately, these babies are sick. So they have bad hearts and bad lungs. Sometimes they may have nerve injuries during operations that we have to keep following up on. And I would say between five to 10% of these babies may need a reoperation as they grow older. So duodenal atresia, for example, when we put it together, even though it looks very good and breast milk just you know, travels very easily through that, once they start incorporating solid foods, we have to make the anastomosis bigger. And, and, and of course we can use the same techniques, but now we're dealing with bigger babies. So when you say um, the gradual, gradual repair of grass, grass gastroschisis, do you mean minutes, hours? What, what do you? Oh, for the silo, we, yeah. we put the silo on and we try to get as aggressive as possible. But I would say if you have to put a silo, ideally in about three days, you would get the bowel all reduced. So we would put ties on the silo twice a day to try to push the bowel and put a little bit of stress on gravity, right? We want gravity to work, but we want to put a little bit of pressure on gravity. That way we can get these defects to be as small as possible. If you just park the silo there and leave it for days, the belly button starts getting bigger, 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 bigger. And now you're dealing with a very big defect. So once you put the silo, you want to get aggressive and two to three days would be ideal to put everything back in if the baby tolerates. And then the defect is not that bad to close. Okay. Let's, let's continue on. I just want to mention, uh, as far as follow-up, too, I want to thank our, our friends at CPQCC, especially Dr. Susan Hintz, Erica Gray, um, for follow-up, for high-risk infant follow-up, surgery itself is not an indication or inclusion, so you can go to the CPQCC website if you'd like to look at what follow-up is included for HRIF. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about now about family-centered care. Yeah. Dr. Bersoni. So, um, two, two ends of this. So the first one I want to talk about is, you know, preparation, um, and the actual care of the family, the parents, as they cope with the anxiety, uh, related to their babies going to the OR. Yeah, that's, um, you can imagine there's very different responses. There's parents with a lot of education, a lot of research, um, that they've done for this time. And, and we all have to be ready for that. So that's good. Keeps us updated, keeps us on our toes. So make, make sure you know, we can um, deliver the best care we can. But so many families have no clue what's going on. And um, you're going to see babies that look completely healthy. For example, a congenital lung 
malformation. They look completely healthy, but we know what's going on in there, that they're going to get in trouble as they grow older. So we have to bring a healthy baby to the operating room and return a healthy baby to the operating room. So everything against us, right? And, and, and that is um, sort of a level of anxiety that we have that we, we have to let the families know and we have to partner with them. And, and, and I'm all about partnering with parents because I'm gonna need them to care for their baby when they're at home. They're gonna see them 24 hours a day. I'm gonna see them just for a few hours or a few days. So, so we really need to partner with them, explain them. I do a lot of pictures. I, I draw things that I sometimes leave in the chart and, and, and give them these things so they can understand what we're dealing with. Overall, I think when they see that the, their surgeon is also vulnerable and, and, and they understand what they're going through, the connection happens. And, and I think that's what I look for, to try to connect with them in a way that we're both really looking for after their children, like if, if he or she was our own. So um, sure. it's important yeah. because if they have no compliance postoperatively, there's many times we do surgeries for imperfect anus that need anal dilations, which just sounds terrible to do it in a house. And then all of a sudden it's the most, most normal thing. You know, it's a very common thing. So you have to go through this learning curve with parents also, not only for us in the operating room, but only also with them. Are, there, are, are the opportunities different when you're working with families who have neonates, newborns who have gone with, through surgery versus three, four, five, six, seven year olds? Yeah, it's hard. There's different emotions, as you can imagine. I think with newborns, the, the, the general knowledge is that you can break them at home, right? Like everybody thinks like, you, you know, you can't do this or that, but they're strong, stronger than you think. And I try to explain to these parents that, you know, it's all right. You won't break anything. You need to help us care for this wound or these dilations or the way you're going to feed these babies. The problem is that they don't communicate and that's where the parents get frustrated because all we get is a call that the baby's crying, but there's no symptoms. As they grow older, they start verbalizing what's happening and, and we get a lot of information and I think it's easier for us to treat that. With neonates, we just have to do what we feel is going on. And same thing with the parents, it's just the feel thing. Are they suffering or not? You make these big incisions sometimes and who knows how much pain they have. All these scoring systems are very hard to tell and, um, as long as you think you're doing the best you can, to me, that's the message for the parents, uh, for neonates, uh, just don't feel bad about it. I mean, you are trying your best. In toddlers, you can chat with them and get some information. So it makes it a little bit easier. Right, I, I, that e I didn't even put two and two together on that one. So you're right, you have a, a different population entirely. Are there, you know, you, you reference this photo that this parent sent to you post-surgery. Yeah. Right. And I mean, obviously, that person was very anxious over, you know, what they were seeing, what they were experiencing. Are there, um, you know, do you know, do social workers work with these parents? Are there support? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Social workers, you know, their services are key for this. Not only that, but child life services, you know, where, where they put the patients in a sort of a mock operating room with dolls and they bring dogs and, and they try to make it as pleasant as possible for them. So it's sort of a good memory overall. Um, but yes, we couldn't do it without them. The IV placement, the level of anxiety for everybody, you know, the child and, and the family, but, but we do use their services. Thankfully, we have a great team here who, who helps us navigate through all these troubles. And great anesthesiologists, right? They're key to all of this. Absolutely, yeah. We only work with pediatric right. anesthesiologists and, and, and they understand what's going on. We've done a lot of work in virtual reality. So there are some procedures that are very minor and we try not to put them to sleep and we just put them on their VR um, goggles and you can just do a procedure and they can never even tell. You know, so, so there are different ways of distracting them um, we put screens on the gurneys as they go into the operating room with mini projectors that they have a movie the whole time as they walk into the operating room. And that's all hard work of anesthesia, child life. And, uh, and, and, you know, we just love to see that. Absolutely. Get back to a clinical question here. Advances, what's, what's in store? What's, what advances are out there in the management of neck? Of necrotizing intracolitis? Yeah. 
Well, not a lot of minimal access surgery, unfortunately. We, yeah. we can deal with some of the long-term strictures that these babies have. Yes. So when you get necrotizing intracolitis, maybe three, four, five weeks later, you develop a, a stricture in the colon that could be de dealt with minimally invasive-wise because now the bowel is healthy. All the inflammation has gone away and we, we can... Um, deal with that. The problem is that neck babies tend to be very low weight and premature. And uh, unfortunately, you know, there's, there's not much we can do with these technique techniques. And as you know, there's the eternal debate of doing laparotomies versus drain placement uh, in babies that have necrotizing enterocolitis. So meaning babies that all of a sudden get very sick and have free air. Some surgeons will just pop in a drain and let things heal on their own. Other surgeons will make laparotomies and try to do more work and remove the bowel that is bad, bring ostomies to the skin. And um, there are many studies that study this and the most latest study, so this would be the update, is that you know the, um, depending on where you think is spontaneous idle perforation or necrotizing intracolitis, drains and laparotomies in, in little babies show very different uh, short term, very similar short term outcomes, but the long term outcomes when you put a drain could result in neurologic problems because these babies are in the NICU for longer and the, the sort of the systemic disease is there for longer when you just drain it instead of uh, fixing it. So that's going to be a question very difficult to answer um, in the years to come because it, it's you need massive amount of patients to detect differences. Um, but that's sort of what we know these days is that um, babies that are very, very sick to go to the operating room or to get laparotomies, we place drains on babies that seem a little, you know, stronger and the disease process not as bad, we tend to operate more. All right. I'm checking to see if there's any other questions that are coming in. You're, you're, you're doing a great job sticking with me on all these questions, so I so appreciate it. No, no problem. No, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad people are, are having fun. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's absolutely wonderful. And the mix today has just been incredible. So we're so grateful to all our faculty today. So I think that's probably going to be it for this session. Great. Dr. Brussoni, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, we really so appreciate it. And obviously, thank you for you because you're a very special person and your skill set is uh, exemplary. We're very lucky. Thank you. No, it was a pleasure to be here. Sorry we got disconnected for a little bit. All good. Hopefully, we all good. Uh, I mean, if we don't have any problems, what would we be? What would I know. It has to be right? real. Right? Exactly. Yeah. All right, everybody, you've got a little break. Let's see. Let me check the schedule here. Uh, you've got a break. Please return back uh, before I believe it's 1220. We're going to, excuse me, 220. We're going to finish up with Dr. Tricia Wright. <laughs> excuse me, from UCSF. I feel like Oprah Winfrey. Um, anyway, thank you, everybody. And Dr. Brissoni, have a great afternoon. You too. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye.